Okay, hi guys, welcome to Biology Online with Henny van Vieren. Hi you 13s, um, welcome back to another lesson in trends in human evolution. Last time I showed you how I did not make fire with a bow drill, but I used modern stuff and I still couldn't do it and that shows you how good these guys were. However, um, we talked about how fire brought everybody together, now they're sitting around the fire and more cultural things are developing. Also, into the Bronze Age, and now suddenly you have an excess of things, and you want to store stuff, and that's why we we went on to pottery, and our knives became better, and eventually the copper that was found naturally was mixed with tin, and <coughs> to make it stronger, and hence you have bronze. Now, imagine a copper wire. Copper wire is really bendy, as you all know. So that is why copper wire and copper is not good for knives that need to be strong and stay sharp. So copper was about the first usage about 9,000 years ago and then about 6,500 years ago they saw them using it in a, in a fire the first time and smelting it and then 5,000 years ago the Bronze Age started and they added tin to make it stronger. Okay, um, so we have to move on to art and cultural evolution of art. <coughs> now when you look at these, these are pictures of, I don't know what type of figure that is, is it a person or a dragon or something, but this is um, examples of Neanderthal art. So a ha Homo Neanderthalensis art about 65,000 years old. That is amazing. That picture that is on that wall is 65,000 years old. And look at that, that genuinely to me resembles a horse. Um, it was found in a, in a cave in Spain and the same type of pigment has been dated out, dated to other art forms that has been used as long as 115,000 years ago. And can everybody guess what that pigment is? The pigment in this is ochre. Ochre is another word for iron oxide. And iron oxide is another word for rust. So iron oxide, as you know, or rust, is that reddish, oran orangey, brownish color. And if you have soil, or clay specifically, that contains a lot of iron, it will be exposed to oxygen, and hence you will have iron oxide forming. And when you take that and you mix it with, for instance, oil, um, you can use it as a pigment. So examples of that in New Zealand, the Maori, they actually took um, close to where I live in Cockle Bay. There's a there's a commemorative plaque that refers to the mark of Manawatere, and if you look at the traditional um, iwi that lived in this area, there's actually a area that's called Shark Pool, where they used to catch hammerhead sharks because there's a lot of hammerheads where I live, and they used to take them and then they used to boil the fat until they could get the fat into a liquid form. They would mix that with the iron or uh, iron oxide rich soil or iron ox oxide rich clay and then they would paint on well, not only the walls but also the waka and their faces and all of their, their carvings and that's why today when you look at traditional Maori um, carving and so forth, it's all that red color and that is because of the iron oxide soil mixed with some kind of oil and in our local iwi over here that would be shark fat, that's crazy but that shark fat and also the, the iron oxide gave a preservative effect and you can't have things like wood borer and other things going in there so it is really actually an amazing way to keep also your waka from um, <coughs> getting waterlogged, um, helping to seal them and keep them safe as they use them to to sail and battle around. But anyways, um, so the same pigment as we said earlier was used at about 115,000 years ago. Um, here's there are some suggestions that the art and creativity could date back to common an ancestor like Homo antecessor. Okay, 
So we had a common ancestor between Neanderthalus and Homo sapiens called Homo antecessor. And some scholars actually suggest that Homo neanderthalensis was part of Homo sapiens. So you would have Homo sapiens subspecies neanderthalensis. However, most scholars these days believe that they were two different species and we interbred when we did find them. So think about the crudes, where you have um, Homo neanderthalensis, they are the crudes, and then you have Guy, which is Homo sapiens, and how they then eventually interbred um, and Homo sapiens then took over. So here's some very early examples in uh, Sulawesi cave um, this is about 38,000 years ago and what was the first thing we do let's make some graffiti yeah but what's important when you look at these hands is the length of the thumb versus the ring finger length of the thumb and the ring finger and you can see that they will be able to have that precision grip and they will be able to have that power grip um, and it just shows you how biologically we moved on and then how these different things allowed us to have more brain development and eventually get to something like art form. Okay, some other Paleolithic art and you can see here that 35,000 years ago use humans were producing art of a very high standard. This is one of the oldest pieces of art that we have available today. It's called the Venus of Hole Fells. It's about 10 centimeters big. And it's carved out of mammoth ivory. And it's believed to be between 30,000 and 35,000 years ago. That is huge. Somebody sat there and they carved something 35,000 years ago. Now, something that is important is note the exaggerated breasts, buttocks, and body fat in general. If you look at another Venus, the Venus of Willendorf, about 28,000 years ago, and that was carved out, out of limestone. Again, we have exaggerated breasts and body fat, the buttocks, etc. Now let's think about that for a moment. I think I mentioned that in a previous video, but if you're a hunter-gatherer or an early farmer that has gone to agriculture, if you are really successful at what you're doing, is your family and wife going to be skinny or will they be obese? Well, the better you are, the more obese your family will be. The better you are, the more at providing for them, the, the, the more fat they will put on. And that is actually a sign of success. And I'm talking about 20, 30 years ago, even less, uh, probably 10 years ago, in Africa, it is believed, I mean, I've had a lot of people, um, as you grow older, you put on weight, and then people, oh, you're doing so well, you must be rich, because look how fat you're getting, or it was actually desirable to have a a wife that is that is more obese, because it shows that you are providing for her very well, so something from that African experience that I've had is translating into this, whereas where we are now in European culture or in the Western culture, it is not necessarily something that we desire. However, think about um, Kardashians, what is it, Kim Kardashian? So as little as 10 years ago, nobody wanted to have a big bottom. And suddenly Kim Kardashian moves on to the picture and now big, everybody wants a big bottom. How does that work? So you can see how the different memes, if you want to call it that, as a desirable effect has had an effect on the different cultures. So this is a painting of the sorcerer um, dressed in an animal skin. So you can see it's a human, but dressed in this animal skin about 15,000 years ago on a cave wall in the Pyrenees Mountains. I believe the Pyrenees Mountains are in South America. This is an example of rock art found in the southern Spain. Oh, sorry. Southern France. Um, just beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. So look at the detail. But all of this was how we started to imagine things and use our imagination 
and allowed us to be more free in our thinking. Now, for me as a scientist, um, I always felt like, oh, so art, art, art. But you know what? Art is really important because it frees up our thinking. And a free thinker is somebody that can invent new things. And when you invent new things, you progress. So having art is really, really important. And it shows you how our brains have developed over time. So this is in the La Salle Caves, um, containing some of the earliest known art dating back to 25,000 before Christ. And above you can see that's a horse, but also look at this geometric symbol above the horse. We still have no idea what it means, but maybe it meant that, look at the horse, I now own four of them, or I have four of them in a pen or something. Um, on the right is an aurochs, it's a now an extinct giant ox. But if you look at it carefully, you can see that it was painted over some of the older pictures. So, look, recycling! <laughs> but anyways, um, you can see how much more sophisticated it was in comparison to some of the earlier pictures that they made. And Paleolithic art. And then we get to cave paintings. So one of the most famous examples of Paleolithic art was found in the caves of La Salle in the Dordogne Valley in France. Um, you can see somebody is hunting with a spear. Um, you can see that's the the aurochs again. You can see there's different kinds of deer. There's the face of the aurochs. So from the aurochs we're going down into this. Um, absolutely gorgeous and if you ever have the chance to visit South Africa and go and look at some in the olden days we used to call them Bushman paintings or Sun S-A-N the Sun people they used to do a lot of um, painting and we used to go on overnight hikes and to look at some of the, the, the cave paintings that was done there thousands of years old now again looking at the Venus of Willendorf from Austria. This was Venus of Lespocau in France and this is Venus of Le Sol in France. Again guys look at what they're exaggerating. So body fat, large breasts um, and then obviously the pelvic area and a lot of scholars would have said that you know what maybe this was a f a fetish on the fertility regions of the human. Um, in other words, caveman pornography, which is it's kind of scary when you think about it. Other scholars have suggested that these are tools that they use to... Um, an ancient midwife would go and say, well, you're going to have a baby and you have to breastfeed and wear the baby how it's going to come out when you g give birth and so forth but in all of them look they don't yet have the skill to create the facial features so all of them they do not include that here's some more of that I like do you know that song I like big butts and I don't know why um, but you can see again desirable features of the time now, this lady over here, she is called Sarki Bart Bartman. Sarki Bartman was a lady of Khoisan descent from South Africa. Um, the Khoisan, and um, in the picture, uh, in the video that I showed you, um, the what's her name? The lady went to go and visit the Sun people, which is a very ancient tribe of people who live in South Africa or Southern Africa. And when they um, shoot an antelope, they would eat it all and then they would put on body fat, and specifically in the buttocks. Um, and this poor lady, when the Europeans arrived in Southern Africa, they exported her to, to Europe. And um, then the Europeans came up with this kind of weird dress that, that does the same thing. And it was a big hoo-ha-ha in South Africa when Sarki Bartman's um, remains were brought back to South Africa to be buried with her ancestors. But yeah, um, you can see there how 
times change and different things become desirable for different people. Alrighty, so cultural evolution is a change in the socially transmitted beliefs, knowledge, custom skills, attitudes and languages. It is the development of our brain. It is not a biological development. It is cultural evolution. Biological evolution is through mutation. Remember, we did that yesterday when we looked at um, the past paper. Biological evolution is when you have a, a random mutation creating a new allele and the new allele is more favorable for the environment that you're in and hence natural selection will select that you have a better, better reproductive success. Whereas cultural evolution is all about how we learn things and how we pass things on and how we gain new skills and language and so forth. <coughs> Here's some abstract art and creative, creative thinking. I have no idea what that is. Um, however, what are the implications of abstract and creative thinking on the development of the endocranial features? Endocranial. Endo means inside. Cranial refers to the cranium or the skull. So, what are the implications of abstract and creative thinking on the development of inside the skull features. Think about the cerebral cortex and the cerebrum, cerebellum and the cerebrum for that matter. Did art drive the development of these areas in the brain? So if you think about the cerebral cortex which is the frontal lobe and so forth, the big part of that is Wernicke's area and also Broca's area because now we have time sitting around a fire and we have extra time and we're creating um, beautiful things and we're talking to each other and we're communicating and we're working together whereas our cerebellum helps to is it the cerebellum or the cerebrum for the moment I can't remember but helps to automate our muscular movement um, so we don't have to concentrate on those things anymore and, and it's a positive feedback so the more we use it the bigger it becomes so it's interesting how art and abstract thinking would literally help us select for a larger brain. Think about it. I'm a caveman. I make this beautiful carving in the wall. And you're a cave girl, for that matter, or whoever. But you love it. And you, you look at the carving and you absolutely love it. And you're so amazed that I could make something like that and lo and behold you know where I'm going through with this so it's natural selection because of the cultural evolution so what are the implications of abstract and creative thinking on the collective learning how is the learning shared again through language and comprehension and what knowledge is shared so that brings us to farming and agriculture. Um, I actually think I'm going to stop over here um, and we'll just call that a day. Thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it and I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much. Keep well. Bye-bye.